Thanks, Phil. Hello, I'm Julia Creasy, Group Sustainability Manager for CRODA. I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about our journey to becoming climate positive. Climate emergency we are currently experiencing means that our climate positive ambition is both our biggest challenge as well as our greatest opportunity. Later on today, you will hear from Jen and Nick with some examples of the implementation of our land and people positive strategies. And we look forward to doing a deep dive into those areas of our strategy at future events. To start, I would like to spend a few moments describing our carbon footprint to add context to the details of our ambition. When we talk about carbon emissions, there are three different types or scopes that we need to consider, which apply to all companies across all industries. Scope one emissions are those emissions which are generated on a company's sites or from company owned vehicles. For Croda, our main source of Scope 1 emissions is burning natural gas within our boilers to generate steam to heat our manufacturing processes. Scope 2 emissions are the indirect emissions associated with the generation of purchased electricity and steam. The emissions are generated off-site, but the energy is used on-site. From the carbon attached to everything else that indirectly touches an organisation falls under an organisation's Scope 3 emissions. For CRODA, our upstream Scope 3 emissions are predominantly made up of the carbon embedded within our raw materials in the purchase goods and services category. Other categories to consider are, for example, business travel, employee commuting and the carbon embedded within our capex investments. An organisation must also consider its downstream Scope 3 emissions. This includes transportation of products, processing of products by our customers, consumer use of products and the end of life treatment of products. To understand the magnitude of these different scopes of carbon for CRODA, it's quite helpful to illustrate it as an iceberg, as you can see in the middle of this slide. In 2018, our emission reduction baseline year, CRODA's scope one and two, or operational emissions, were just under 200,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. This is the part of the iceberg that you can see above the surface. It is within our control and it's relatively easy to measure. It can be easy for an organisation to focus solely on their operational emissions. However, for most companies in most industries, the majority of their carbon lies within their supply chain. For CRODA, our Scope 3 emissions were close to 1 million tonnes of carbon in 2018. So the importance of understanding your supply chain carbon is clear to see. And we received the highest level of verification for our emissions reporting across all scopes in 2019. This supply chain carbon becomes even more important for our consumer facing customers. The chart on the right shows the percentage of scope 3 emissions per industry. You can see for consumer products companies, some of our biggest customers, that 98% of their carbon emissions lie within their supply chain. The support that we can therefore offer these customers through our low carbon solutions can really help them to address this carbon iceberg. Our customers need suppliers like CRODA, they cannot decarbonise without us. Our objective is to be climate positive, and as you heard in Stuart's section, this means that we will enable more carbon to be saved than we emit. This ambition is very well aligned with our business model. We have a heritage of using bio-based raw materials, and we know that these materials sequester carbon from the atmosphere during their growth and are carbon neutral over their lifetime. This, coupled with renewable energy investments around our manufacturing sites dating back many years, means that we can provide our customers with low cradle to gate carbon footprint products. As Phil has already said, we have a history of achieving in terms of reducing our carbon footprint. Since 2006, our absolute operational emissions have reduced by 35%, decoupled from our continuous business growth. On top of this, our products offer our customers many different sustainability benefits in use, which often have a carbon saving attached. So our climate positive objective is a chance for us to really build on our low carbon heritage and ramp up our level of ambition during this critical decade for climate action. So how do we deliver this low carbon? As we saw on the last slide, we address this in two ways. We can reduce the carbon footprint of our product manufacture, and we have two targets that are really addressing that. In sustainable innovation, we are moving to more bio-based raw materials, replacing existing petrochemical raw materials where possible. We're also investing a lot into R&D for new alternatives, for example, biotech, and designing new bio-based products. In 2019, over 200,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide were sequestered during the growth of rapeseed, just one of our key bio-based raw materials. 
We are also reducing our operational emissions by moving to renewable sources of energy, reducing our energy use, and looking for innovative process technologies. We've had a wind turbine at our whole manufacturing site in the UK since 2006, generating electricity to help power the site. Another example is our manufacturing site in Gouda in the Netherlands, where we are generating our own biogas through anaerobic digestion of one of our byproducts, which is used to generate heat and electricity for the site. Both areas provide real customer benefits, helping customers to reduce their scope three upstream scope three carbon emissions by reducing the carbon embedded in the raw materials which they purchase from us. On the right hand side, we're increasing the amount of carbon which is saved through the use of our products with our carbon cover target. By 2030, the use of our products will save four times more carbon than all of the carbon we emit as an organisation, that is our scope one, two and three emissions. We have four case studies where the avoided emissions associated with the use of our products have been quantified and externally verified, which you can see here on the slide. Martin will be talking about coal tide radiance later, but we also have examples of friction modifiers which increase fuel efficiency of vehicles, surfactants to enable emulsions of low VOC water-based paint and adhesives to help bond different materials to enable automotive light weighting. These case studies are proving successful in generating customer in interest through marketing literature and can help customers with their downstream stream scope three carbon emissions, as well as helping to drive consumer engagement tackling another important scope three category. So how are we planning to reduce our carbon footprint further? In 2019, we committed to set a science-based target. That is an emissions reduction target aligned with the science required to limit global temperature rises to at a minimum well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. This month, the science-based targets initiative reached the milestone of 1000 companies committing to set a science-based target. Furthermore, also in 2019, our CEO Steve Butts signed a UN Global Compact call to action for business leaders to commit to a one and a half degree future, which means we will set a science-based target aligned to the most ambitious one and a half degree pathway, as well as committing to become a net zero organisation by 2050. The chemical sector is classified as hard to decarbonise by the World Economic Forum. And therefore, it's maybe not a surprise that to date, only eight companies within our sector have had their science-based targets verified. Of these, there are only two aligned with the most ambitious one and a half degree pathway. Once our target has been validated, this would make us the third. So we're therefore showing real leadership in our level of ambition within our energy intensive industry. The climate science dictates the level of emissions reductions required to limit global warming to one and a half degrees. And so where we lead, others in our industry must follow if we are to avoid the most dramatic effects of climate change. Chart on the right shows our target and required reductions per annum. We require a 4.2% linear reduction in emissions between now and 2030. Our 2030 target is our interim target before achieving net zero by 2050. So the key point here is the gradient change at 2030. The level of emissions reductions must be more ambitious and faster up to 2030 to avoid overshooting the one and a half degrees rise in global temperature. If most of a company's emissions lie within the supply chain, then the science based target initiative stipulates that a scope three target is required. For our scope three emissions reductions, we want to focus on the purchase goods and services category as the area for where we can achieve the greatest reductions and have the greatest impact. This will involve direct supplier engagement to understand the carbon impact associated with our raw materials and to work with them to encourage their own emissions reductions. We will eventually choose suppliers that can offer us the lowest carbon footprint for our raw materials. The leadership position that we are taking in our emissions reduction targets allows us to really drive change throughout our supply chain, as well as support our customers in their decarbonisation ambitions. One of the most important things for us as a business is to ensure that we decarbonise credibly. This slide explains a little bit more about what I mean by that. There are three main areas for us to focus on for us to be able to achieve our emissions reduction targets. Clearly, the first is carbon reduction itself. As we work with our manufacturing sites around the world, we are focusing on energy hierarchy. First, we want to use less energy and eliminate the need for energy. Where this is not possible, we are looking at how we can become much more energy efficient and how we can reuse waste energy before we move to renewable energy and new low carbon technologies. 
We are working with our top 10 emitting manufacturing sites on decarbonisation roadmaps this year, which I will talk to you a little bit more about on my next slide. There will be an element of carbon compensation required for us to meet our net zero ambition by 2050, as we will not be able to remove all residual emissions, particularly in the supply chain. However, clearly the focus at the moment is on emissions reductions and compensation will become a part of our strategy beyond 2030. For carbon, carbon compensation to be credible, we will be looking for greenhouse gas removals. This is a more permanent removal of carbon from the atmosphere, for example, using technologies such as carbon capture and storage. There may be an element of carbon offsetting along the way to get to net zero, but it's not a credible option for companies to buy their way out of this with offsets. We will be looking for maximum credibility from any compensation. The third box of this slide talks about carbon management. There are many tools and techniques we can use that will help us in our journey to become a net zero organisation. We're introducing an internal price of carbon into all of our CapEx proposals before the end of this year. Our R&D teams are already thinking about how they can deliver on our sustainable innovation targets and have introduced some new ways of working. This will lead in time to a product portfolio shift that will really help us in our emissions reduction targets. We have many partnerships and open innovation programmes looking into novel technologies to make our chemistries in a low carbon way. The key point from this slide is that we are looking at lots of different options and we will need more than one solution on the road to net zero. The solutions we choose must be the right ones, not just for Croda and our targets, but for society to ensure we can decarbonise credibly and sustainably. By doing all these things, we will make Croda climate positive by 2030. I talked about our decarbonisation roadmaps and on the left hand side, our approach to reducing our carbon footprint and achieving our science based targets can be seen. By the end of 2020, our top 10 emitting manufacturing sites will have completed decarbonisation roadmaps. These roadmaps will plot over the course of the next 10 years the projects that will need to take place to enable the manufacturing site to reduce its emissions by 50%. An, an idea of the level of the cost associated with this as well, as well as timelines. These roadmaps have business growth and any capacity expansions built into them. Work has also commenced engaging suppliers to gather primary data on the carbon impact of our raw materials to be able to start seeing these reducing as our suppliers decarbonise or as we shift our portfolio. By 2022, we expect all our locations, including all our offices and warehouses, to have decarbonisation roadmaps finalised and be working towards their achievement. Our year-on-year -year emissions reductions will be progressing. The sites will be getting on with things that are easy to implement, for example, energy efficiency initiatives. And then between now and 2030, key site decarbonisation projects will start to come online. We're currently quantifying exactly what this will look like as all of our roadmaps come together. And so we want to take a corporate level view of where best to invest to have the greatest impact in terms of decarbonisation. Many of our sites have synergies across chemistry platforms. And so we may be able to implement the same technology at several sites. And some sites may be able to achieve greater emissions reductions than others. But by 2030, we should have achieved our interim science-based target and have a clear path to net zero by 2050. Moving to the right-hand side, you can see our carbon cover roadmap, thinking about the carbon savings through our product use. I mentioned the case studies on an earlier slide, and sales of these products in 2019 will lead to over 850,000 tonnes of carbon avoided throughout their lifetime, which is a great start. In our discovery phase, we are looking for further case studies where we can quantify the avoided emissions associated with our existing products in application. At the same time, our R&D teams have already started to innovate to develop new products that will have a carbon cover ratio of greater than four to one. And we now measure the carbon cover for all new product launches. A key consideration for us is how we quantify the carbon cover associated with a much larger proportion of our portfolio. Our current case studies look at specific products into specific applications. But Croda has 7,000 products and 17,000 customers, and so this is too big a job to do on a case-by-case -case basis by 2030. We're thinking about how we can look at broader product application buckets to understand the associated carbon savings while still quantifying numbers credibly and with a level of external verification. 2030, if we achieve our emission reduction target and we achieve our carbon cover target, 
then 3.8 million tonnes of carbon will be being avoided every year through the use of our products, which is equivalent to the greenhouse gas emissions avoided by 820 wind turbines running every year, which will be a fantastic achievement and a demonstration of a climate positive CRODA. I'd now like to share a case study with you to pull together everything we have described around our climate positive ambition, demonstrating how we can really add value to our customers. The case study I want to use is our new biosurfactant plant in North America. This is a very exciting opportunity for Croda as we can move existing customers over to bio-based surfactants from petrochemical-based surfactants. Also, we are finding new customers across our business sectors purchasing our eco range with a robust $20 million future sales pipeline. Offering 100% bio-based surfactants with identical performance aligns very well with our customers' ambitions. For example, Unilever, who have committed to eliminate fossil-based materials in their cleaning products by 2030. It's clear to see that the business case is strong and very much aligned to our customers' needs, but the sustainability and carbon story is even stronger. The manufacturing of our eco range of surfactants is low carbon due to the renewable energy that is used on our site. Back in 2012, we installed a landfill gas pipe from the local landfill site to the site where our biosurfactants plant is based, and we use this landfill gas to generate steam and electricity. As shown in, your, in the bottom right of your screen, we also have an on-site solar farm generating renewable electricity, and then where we have to top up our electricity used by purchasing from the grid, we also purchase renewable energy certi certificates, meaning that 100% of our electricity used on site is renewable. We've calculated the carbon benefits associated with burning this landfill gas since 2012. As well as the avoided emissions associated with natural gas, there is a big saving with burning methane to generate biogenic CO2 rather than letting it dissipate atmosphere from the landfill site, as methane has a global warming potential 25 times greater than carbon dioxide. So combined, the savings attached to the, our use of landfill gas since 2012 are now equivalent to 1.3 million tonnes of avoided carbon dioxide. We can bring these carbon benefits to life with an example using our tween range of surfactants from Croda Crop Care. In the sustainability world, you hear a lot about circularity, and here we have a circular case study demonstrating what we mean by climate positive. Tweens can be used as an adjuvant to help increase the efficiency of pesticide use and help farmers increase their yields. In 2018, a customer purchasing from our tween range manufactured in North America would have been receiving that product with a carbon footprint of just over two, two and a half kilograms of CO2 per kilogram. This includes the benefits of renewable energy use at site, as I've just mentioned. By 2030, as with all of our manufacturing sites, our biosurfactants plant would have reduced their emissions by 50%, completing their decarbonisation roadmap. And so the customer would see these savings in an 11% reduction in cradle to gate carbon footprint. As of 2020, our customer can switch to the eco range of tweens, receiving a further carbon benefit associated with the lower carbon footprint of bioethylene oxide compared to petrochemical. The carbon footprint of their tween product is now reduced by 23% compared to 2018. But we don't want to stop there, and we have plans to move to alternative feedstocks for our bioethanol, for example, sugarcane. We also anticipate increased efficiency as our biosurfactant plant moves to full capacity. Therefore, by 2030, our customer will be receiving their tween with a 71% reduction in carbon footprint since 2018. This is a big saving for our customer's scope 3 emissions profile, with a combined 1.82 kilogram of CO2 saved per kilogram of product purchase by 2030. As most of our customers' carbon lies within their supply chain, this will bring big benefits and help our customers with their science-based targets. But in this example case study, the benefits do not stop there. The customer will use this eco-tween in a crop care formulation. The adjuvancy effect of Crodus tween surfactant helping to minimise pesticide use, maximise yields and therefore reduce the carbon impact of agricultural practices, helping avoid emissions for their customers, which benefits their own downstream scope 3 emissions and contributes to our carbon cover target. Now let us assume that this crop formulation containing Crodus tween is applied to a corn crop in the US. Maximising yields has a carbon benefit, but more importantly a land use benefit, as less land is required to grow enough corn to meet demand. 
These land savings associated with growing US corn will mean our land use footprint attached to our biobasal factors will be reduced, helping us to achieve our land positive target. This circular case study brings to life the major benefits of our climate positive bias factors to customers, as well as to us achieving our commitment and the importance of collaboration throughout the supply chain in achieving sustainability goals. In summary, our climate positive strategy will allow us to save more carbon than we emit. We can support our customers in reducing their scope three carbon iceberg by reducing our carbon footprint through moving to more bio-based raw materials and decarbonizing our manufacturing sites, as well as delivering products which save carbon in use. We will decarbonize credibly in order to achieve our science-based target. Our proven track record gives us confidence in our ability to achieve. Our biosurfactants offer circular carbon benefits throughout the supply chain, allowing us to demonstrate the real benefits of a climate-positive CRODA. Thank you.